Between Two Worlds by Julia Seaton, M.D. Published in The Occult Digest, Volume 5, Number 6, June 1929. There are some things so self-evidently true. No amount of proof can make their truth more apparent. Yet one hesitates to tell of them, or even to seem to stand pat in their defense. That is why I approach my story with diffidence. The events I must set forth are so extraordinary, it is scarcely possible for them to be accepted without considerable incredulity or even scorn. But I feel bound to make allowance for all these things beforehand, and am prepared to face them with stoical indifference. For many years, I have been a practicing physician in Washington, D.C. My home practice has always been large and interesting, and my friends are usually intelligent and of assured position in life, all of which makes my story much like a fable, at least to my friends. My house is large and surrounded by a pleasant garden with many shady retreats and numerous flowers and fruit trees, also a murmuring waterfall. My office and laboratory are in an addition built onto the house. Around neither house nor office is there anything whatever hinting of mystery. I had just finished with my usual run of patients and was preparing to work in the laboratory with my assistant when the office man brought me a telegram. It read, coming on 7 p.m. train. For God's sake, wait for me, and was signed, Hassan. I looked at my watch. It was then 6.45 p.m. Hassan I knew well. We graduated in the same class. There had always been a certain occult friendship between us. When together, we enjoyed some sort of new and wide expansion of thought. Often we had marveled at this and at the way our perceptive faculties were intensified, giving us a strange feeling of unlimited existence in which we sometimes seemed to merge into one being, at the same time contacting the whole universe. Hassan many times remarked, Great Scott, old man, if we kept this up, we could open up some of the old world's secrets. This is better than opium, for we have all this extension of mind and yet retain all our normal senses. Sometimes I felt as if we ought to break this unusual contact before we stumbled onto something we did not know how to handle. But curiosity let me go on. Then we graduated, and time and different interests settled the whole question for us, Hassan's profession taking him east while I went west. Promptly at seven, Dr. Hassan arrived. I could see that he was unusually excited. We seated ourselves in big, comfortable chairs and lit our large mirskoms filled with fine Turkish tobacco. He smoked for some time in silence. Then turning suddenly, he said, Look here, Grayson. What would you do if you had to battle for your life with some enemy you could not see? Or to put the question another way, what would you do if every hour of your life you were controlled and directed by some person you could not touch or see, yet who exacted the utmost obedience from you? never allowing you to disobey for one moment any command he gave. I looked at him, drew several long puffs of smoke, then said, I would have to be convinced first that such a thing really existed, that it was not the fermentation of my own mind. Hassan settled himself a little more comfortably in his chair and began telling me the cause of his sudden visit. I am skeptical about many things, but even as I listened, Long before I had any thought of passing through the things that followed, I could not help feeling that he had convinced himself, at least, of the truth of what he was telling. As I looked into his two bright eyes and watched his twitching hands, I could see that it was time he either had a holiday or found a friend who could help him through his dilemma. We talked until far into the night. I listened with every show of enthusiasm, checking him now and then as he went on with his startling story. I became convinced that if all he said were true, we stood on the edge of one of the most subtle psychic experiences the world had ever known. Or else here at least was the story of no ordinary madman. When he finished talking, we sat a while in silence, he waiting for my opinion and I giving myself time to determine my best plan of action. Finally, after a long inward battle, I was just on the point of speaking when I felt coming on that strange extension of consciousness which we so often had touched when together. Hassan turned quickly, half rose, and held up his hand. Wait, Grayson, he commanded. If we can get together as we used to do, become en rapport, perhaps I can transfer this strange experience to you. We paused a moment, and then suddenly all the sensation had passed. I had evolved my plan. I said, Hassan, we won't try to dig this out tonight. 
I must think it over carefully before I give you my opinion. Wait until morning, then we will go over the whole ground again. Each went to his own room. I sat down for a while to think everything over and to ponder on the fact that while the extension of faculties which I had felt with him had passed for the moment, yet I felt an almost imperceptible quiver along my veins, showing me that it might be reawakened at a moment's notice. At last I undressed and went to bed, my mind running riot. I thought he must be deceived. It seemed improbable that anything he related could be true. The clock struck two and then I must have gone to sleep. Suddenly I awoke, and in the dark I plainly felt a cool, strong hand pass over my face. I sat up startled, my heart beating furiously. I am not a coward, but somehow the room seemed full of hidden, deadly enemies. I jumped to the floor and pulled the electric light cord, but the globe had burned out. Then gradually a faint bluish-white light, like a tiny star, began to glow just at the bottom of the door. I watched it fixedly. All at once it flashed brightly and went out while at the same time I was conscious of someone pressing closely against my body from behind. I tried to spring forward. My body acted instinctively, while my mind whirled dizzily. In spite of my attempt to move, my feet were as if glued to the floor. A strong hand fell firmly, albeit lightly, upon my shoulder, while an almost inaudible voice whispered in my ear, Go to Hassan's room. Follow the light. Immersed as I was in utter darkness, with some impalpable thing apparently controlling my actions, I struggled fiercely in rebellion. I had always been the master of my own actions. What strange unseen thing was this which had so suddenly taken possession of my will? Turning quickly, I reached fiercely for the hand on my shoulder. No hand was there. I felt myself being forcibly pushed toward the little gleaming light which had now gathered on the knob of the door. Some subtle force, undefined but irresistible, was deliberately urging me on. With all my might, I struggled to gain my self-control, but to no avail. Something like a strong, soft body stood against me in close contact with my back, and I was carried on. The door swung open as we approached it, and I was pushed on down the hall to Dr. Hassan's room. Here also the door swung open with noiseless certainty, and presently I found myself inside. Hassan was standing in the center of the dimly lighted room. I cannot attempt to give any description of his attitude and the unspeakable look of terror on his face. Several times he framed his lips in an effort to speak, but no sound came forth. He was apparently as helpless as I, caught in the grasp of something we could neither see nor hear. He tried to catch hold of my hands, then suddenly the lights went out, and we were both struggling with something that seemed to draw us close to itself. In that invisible suction there came, surging over me, the fatal feeling of a complete loss of identity. Hassan, I managed to cry aloud, Don't give up! Fight! Quick as lightning, I grabbed him by the shoulders. Now I, come on, let's get out of this hellish octopus. Not even now, when I have had time to think it all over, do I know just what happened. But some wonderful instinct of self-preservation must have sustained me, for together we battled with that, something that was like a stifling dragnet. A slow one creeping, something that darkened our senses and checked our movements. Sometimes it was between us, sometimes we seemed to be suddenly merged into it. Again, a hand as strong as iron grasped our throats. In the blackness of the room, the tiny spark of bluish-white light moved and quivered like a will-o'-the-wisp. Hassan never loosed his hold on me, and I held fast to him. But all at once I felt that he was weakening. He half sank to his knees and his head dropped forward on my hand. His senses were yielding to the invisible narcotic presence. In my own befuddled brain, I knew that we had approached a decisive moment. Either we were to become the prey of this devilish obsessing unseen entity, or we were to destroy it forever by some occult turn or other. In my realization of Hassan's failing powers, I seemed to gain additional strength. I tightened my grasp and brought forth new mental energy. I half-dragged Hassan's slumping figure to the door. Something in me was answering the tightened grasp of the thing. I shudder even now as I think of that moment of struggle. With superhuman effort, I shook the hand of iron from my shoulder and tore the door open. I staggered out into the hall, still dragging Hassan, and turned on the light. Hassan fell to the floor and lay full length in a dead faint. I knelt down and shook him. Hassan, Hassan, I cried, come out of it. 
Then, overcome by the effort, I dropped into a nearby chair and lost consciousness. When I came to my senses, Hassan was standing near. He looked haggard and wild-eyed, yet satisfied I had found out that his story was not the work of his imagination, but a problem of the occult laws of life awaiting investigation. The next night, safe in the seclusion of my office, he said to me, Grayson, if this thing we went through last night is only some psychical influence, as you say, what can prevent it from coming again? What proof have we that we will not go through the same experience tonight? And how am I to be sure that I will not be tormented by this thing in the future as I have been in the past? I looked at him, and remembering the events of the night before, I was astonished at being able to treat the affair so calmly. Then I answered, Let us reason it all out, Hassan. You and I have always known that there are many substratums of mind lying just below the normal consciousness. These are not to be feared, but understood. If we accept the law that this surface stratum is filled with things, why should we not accept the fact that all these other levels are also full of their own entities and their possessions? Normally we do not see, hear, nor feel them, but let some irritation of consciousness open our surface mind to their registrations, and we will have psychic sensations and psychic experiences. Hassan shook his head. What then, he asked. As soon as we know the facts about these things, I went on, we can shut our minds against them and reestablish our normal consciousness. The only key that opens the substates of being is fear. Sometimes by the natural laws of our life, we touch these substates, and then our fear of them links us steadfastly to them until we interrupt it. Fear is the only live devil, and in our peculiar intimate association, you communicated your fear to me almost unconsciously. Hence our dual experiences. My courage rescued us, and now that you know the truth, your own reason will protect you. Hassan returned home the next day. He has since become one of the greatest physicians specializing in nervous and mental diseases in the country.